And this will be our last. Oh, we need to close that door there too. I'm hearing feet, hearing myself. There we go. All right. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening that you've given us to come together, Lord, um, in person and uh, through technology. And Lord, we know that wherever uh, your people are, uh, you're with us, our great shepherd. And Lord, also, um, your, your just presence is uh, all throughout the world. But Lord, we're asking for your presence to be here in a special way tonight as we study your word, as we look at this subject of um, just being filled with your Holy Spirit. And we just pray that you would lead and guide tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so if you don't have notes, I don't have any extras to give you, but we're almost done with the notes, and I want to uh, reserve most of the time tonight for just uh, questions and answers, so we'll, we'll try to get through the fill-in-the-blanks part. Sometimes I'm tempted just to skip over stuff, but I know that there's always those type A people, you know, who won't be able to sleep tonight if we don't at least give them the blanks to fill in. So we left off. In, uh, we're going through 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which actually says a lot of things about tongues and uh, tongues and prophecy in particular, uh, the two, two uh, different gifts. And so we're going to pause here for a moment. There's a Okay, so... Um, so we're going through 1 Corinthians 14, and, and the study within and upon, you know, our focus has been on the ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, in the world, uh, coming alongside, uh, it says the, says the Spirit, Jesus said the Spirit is sent into the world to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So God uses his Spirit to draw us to him, to convict us of and then when we're born again, we are born again through the Spirit giving us life and residing in us, which I still believe is one of the most powerful truths in the universe that we uh, overlook and take for granted, uh, something that the Old Testament saints would probably box our ears over because we're not, we don't take it seriously enough. And then what we've been studying is then the, the, the third way the Holy Spirit ministers is to come upon Christians to empower them to do ministry. Sometimes that ministry is for signs for the unsaved, and sometime that, sometimes that ministry is for within the church to, to effectively minister to one another. And so... But in particular, we're talking about, we've been talking about the uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts and how uh, people would be prayed for, either laid hands on or after they were saved, how the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And there would be this initial manifestation, which was often speaking in tongues. It was not exclusively speaking in tongues. And that's why one of the things that I uh, teach, and I'm very, you know, that there's different ideas about this, but this is just kind of where I land. I do believe that when the Spirit comes upon people, both in the Bible and uh, in our own experience today in the 21st century, that uh, it's normative for people to have an experience of speaking in tongues, as it was normative in the book of Acts. But normative is not the same thing as necessary. The Apostle Paul taught not all speak in tongues. And uh, as he talks about the gifts, he talks about how the Holy Spirit distributes those gifts. So, but the subject of tongues seems to be, out of all the gifts, the most controversial. And it's, it's the most uh, strange to some people, and, and rightfully so. I was thinking about this after our last class. And I know that for, for anyone who has never uh, spoken in tongues, it's probably... A, a much greater mystery of and, and a little bit of a, an enigma. And I, I thought, well, how do you, you know, how do you help someone understand what, what is actually happening through the spirit? So 
I, I've never used this illustration before, but the Bible uses it. Uh, but I, I just thought about it in a little different way. And that was, as I mentioned uh, two weeks ago when we had the class, when you are praying in the spirit, so if you're, if you're praying in another language through the spirit, that it's not coming from your mind, it's coming from your, your spirit. But how does that work? Because we only, we're normally used to speaking, starting with what comes from our mind first. Um, and so it occurred to me that I think everybody could relate to at least one thing. Have you ever had such a, um, either a heartbreaking experience or a frustrating experience or just a something that has caused you to groan. So you know, you raise your hand. Have you ever had something that's just so emotionally overwhelming that you vocalize a groan? Now notice you just, you a groan is not something that you even interpret. You know, it, it's an, it, you can interpret it, the emotion of a groan depending on the circumstances but you are actually vocalizing something that's actually not coming out of your mind. That's coming out of your spirit. And it's your, your spirit is overwhelmed or, you, you know, or if you want to say your soul is overwhelmed, whatever, whatever part is overwhelmed, it's overwhelmed enough to actually cause you to groan. Um, and it's not articulate, but it is vocalizing. And I think that's probably the most basic way I could describe it to someone who's never spoken in tongues, that speaking in tongues is, is like that, except it's a little more articulate than a groan. Um, and yet I have, it doesn't surprise me that when seeing um, people filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not uncommon to have them kind of uh, utter somewhat of a, of a groan, not in a, uh, in a strange way, but just they're, they're trying to vocalize something that's coming from their spirit rather than from their mind. And so as we look at this as the subject of tongues, which is once again, um, it's, it's a little less mysterious for those who have experienced it. It's definitely much more mysterious to those who have not. And as I've said before, and I'll just keep saying again, it's not about haves and have nots. If you don't speak in tongues, that's not, um, you know, necessarily one thing or the other, what, whatever gifts are distributed by God, by his spirit uh, are according to his will. And all, and we, we, we benefit the whole church benefits from the variety of gifts. But the reason I'm making an emphasis on tongues is because the book of acts makes an emphasis on it as one of the, the initial experiences along with prophecy. So those are usually the two things, um, mostly tongues, sometimes tongues and prophecy, and once in a while it doesn't even specify. So we're going to pick up where we left off, and that's 1 Corinthians 14. So if you have your Bibles, we're just kind of going verse by verse, and or at least most verses in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, so you can follow along. And we left off at 1 Corinthians 14, 16, where the Apostle Paul, once again, to get us caught up to speed, he's bringing correction to the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church was zealous for the gifts, and it, it appears from what we're reading here that they were very zealous about speaking in tongues, once again, in other languages, by the Spirit, in the, in the community gathering, and that it was causing trouble, and it was, it was not building up. The Apostle Paul uses the term edify numerous times. Edify, it's not a term we use a lot, but it just, it doesn't strengthen or build up the church. So he's bringing correction to their idea that just the practice of speaking in tongues was somehow um, mystically beneficial to everybody in the room, as if you can just all get in the room and everybody speak in tongues and somehow that's going to benefit the Apostle Paul teaches, no, there actually is not a benefit for that. And he's systematically explaining why that's not a benefit, um, though he is for the gift of tongues. And we will see that. So 1 Corinthians 14, 16, as he continues on his correction, he says, otherwise, if you bless, oh, first of all, 15, let me, let's get a little on-ramp here. Uh, let's look, actually, let me just read, uh, starting with 14 and 15. 
So uh, it says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the mind also. So that's kind of our on-ramp. So both uh, praying and singing. Uh, it was interesting. This is just on a side note. I, it doesn't matter to me whether you like Kanye West's new music or not, but uh, Kanye, who's a, now a profess, professing Christian, his last two albums have been um, very Christian in, in many ways. And so he's got a song. Um, I'm trying to remember the title track of that, or, or, or what was the track of the one? It's actually my favorite one on the uh, Come to Life. So he's got a song, Come to Life. So if you, and what was, as I was listening to it, they have like a prayer kind of gospel meeting recording that, that they have going on in the background as he sings over the top of it. And to my surprise, they, and it was, it, I thought it was actually tastefully done and quite beautiful, but there's a woman who's praying and then she begins to pray in tongues and they just include it on the album, on the track. And uh, I've never actually listened to uh, a Christian, you know, uh, track of music where, you know, they had that as, as part of, you know, the background. But um, I was like, I was, hey, that, that woman is speaking in tongues. It's no interpretation, but that's okay. You don't understand much of what's on most of the other tracks either, even when they're in English. But okay, so that's our on-ramp. I will sing with the spirit. And I will sing with the mind also. Verse 16, otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say the amen at your giving of thanks since he does not know what you are saying? For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. So it's interesting that it kind of, it's talking about a gathering of believers, but it even gives a close proximity, <laughs> you know, possibly the person even next to you um, can't discern what you're saying. But one thing we learn here, this is just one of these little golden nuggets, and this is number 24, praying in tongues is also giving thanks to God. So we learn a little bit about what is happening when someone is speaking by the Spirit in other languages, what is being said. Well, the Apostle Paul says you're giving thanks. So that's one of the things we know. As I mentioned, I believe tongues is much more like the Psalms, and prophecy is much more directed to, to the individual or to a community. So you're, you're giving thanks to God, and that's helpful to know. That, um, that's, that's some of what is happening when a person is, is praying in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, he, this is the apostle Paul says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. So number 25, Acts doesn't record Paul uh, receiving the gift of tongues when Ananias laid his hands on him, but we have the apostle Paul testifying of this gift uh, multiple times in the book of Corinthians here, uh, that he has this gift in his own life, and he encourages others to desire earnestly the gifts, which means, um, once again, he's speaking to Christians. This is just another argument for the subsequent um, baptism in the Holy Spirit, the subsequent uh, distribution of the gifts to Christians, since the Apostle Paul is speaking to Christians and saying, desire these things earnestly. Of course, how do you, you just can't, um, you know, we're so used to being able to do things on demand. You know, if we want an app, we can go to the app store and we download it. Uh, but if you want a gift from God, you just have to desire and, and seek God for that. But you can't make it happen. You know, you, that's going to be up to the Lord. But we have our part to play, which is to desire earnestly. So in verse 19, after the apostle Paul tells us, so 25, if you didn't miss, if you did, if you got it subsequent to salvation. And then uh, verse 19, after he tells us that he speaks in tongues more than the, more than all of the Corinthians, which is surprising. I, I don't know it. We don't know what information the apostle Paul had, but we do know that the church, at least when they were coming together, there was a lot of people speaking in tongues all at once and disrupting the service. 
And yet Paul could confidently say, I speak in tongues more than you all. What does that tell us about the apostle Paul and the gift of tongues? He must have been using it often. He must have been using it often and on a regular basis. And uh, so in verse 19, he says, however, even though I, I speak in tongues more than you all, however, in the church, so kind of in the gathering, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. And this becomes very important. And that's why uh, at Living Water Fellowship, even though we, we believe in the gift of tongues, you often don't hear it because we want to be biblical about it. If, um, if there's interpretation, great. But if there's not, it's not beneficial in the gathering to just be praying in tongues. Paul says, I would rather spend, I'd rather speak five words of instruction to you. Uh, you, you know, and you could come up with a lot of really powerful instruction in five words. You know, you can do, even do three words, love one another. You know, there's three words. That's a very powerful instruction. So he would rather give some exhortation that would, would actually strengthen the church. So he says, this is just, it doesn't strengthen the church because it's not understood. And so it doesn't just, just the, the practice itself doesn't have some mystical ability to strengthen the church. It, it may strengthen you as an individual, but that's not the purpose of coming together as a church. So number 26, Paul was trying to teach them balance and propriety concerning the gifts. He was for the gifts. He was not against them, but he wanted them to be used in a way that would build up and benefit the church, not um, not be a deficit. And so in verse 20, he goes on to say, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law, it is written by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? Yes, they will. <laughs> That's exactly what happens when a bunch of people are speaking in tongues and either unbelievers or ungifted. It's usually nothing. It's, it's not something that impresses people and, um, you know, go, oh, wow, look at this, you know, because they don't, they don't understand what's going on. It, there's nothing that they can, as an either ungifted, as it says, or as an unbeliever, can comprehend. So now this prophecy here, I'm, I don't want to actually spend too much time on this. It's a little complicated, the way the Apostle Paul uses this prophecy because it had a context in the Old Testament that didn't really have to do with the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. But he, he appropriates it uh, for this situation, and, um, and, it, and it's not an easy passage to teach. And I don't, like I said, I want to get bogged down, but let's, let me see if I can keep it simple. So number, verse 27, this prophecy was one of many about coming judgment upon Israel for their waywardness, unbelief, and rejection of God. So that it was, it was about coming judgment. And, it, and there are those who believe that it had a more uh, immediate um, application when it was given in regard to um, the nations he was bringing against you know, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen to me. Some believe that is uh, like the, whether it was the, the Babylonians or the Assyrians who had a different language, who God was using to bring discipline against Israel. And yet he was bringing these other people with, with another tongue. And yet uh, they, the nation still would not listen. But some others believe that this is specifically anticipating the the gift of 
people speaking in tongues after the when the Messiah would come. And this anticipates the judgment of God upon Israel in 70 AD, when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, that it was a sign to the nation uh, based on this prophecy. You've been given a sign and you've been warned through this sign that judgment is coming. And even so, you've, you've, this is a, it's, pro, it's prophecy. It's, it already sees the response. Even so, they will not listen to me. I've given them this wonderful sign that identifies that the time is, is at hand to repent and turn. So number 28 um, in your notes, this is kind of like listening to one side of a conversation. It appears that Paul is aware of the thinking in the Corinthian church, which, which somehow motivated them all to be speaking in tongues at once without interpretation. It appears that they considered this a sign in the church that was beneficial. So, you know, we're, we're just seeing half of it. So he calls this kind of thinking as childish. So that's what you're filling the blank there. He calls this thinking childish and exhorts them on to mature th thinking. He uses prophecy uh, to give them better understanding of the use of tongues. He uses this prophecy in the Old Testament to help them understand tongues as a sign. Tongues as a sign was just a sign. A sign does not convict people necessarily. A sign is just indicating something's about to happen and God has given you a fair warning. It's kind of like he's sent off a flare. He's given some indicator. So the sign is not the same thing as that which benefits the church or even may benefit an unbeliever. If you remember in Acts chapter 2, so the sign was given 120 people in Jerusalem, all of a sudden the spirit coming upon them, all speaking in tongues, they, it, it drew masses of people, but it wasn't the speaking in tongues that caused them to turn their hearts to God. It was the preaching in an, in an understandable language of the gospel by the apostle Peter. That's what caused them to say, what must we do to be saved? It wasn't the it wasn't the tongues speaking in tongues. That was just a sign. So when it's, when it's meant as a sign, it's meant to be a sign to unbelievers. Believers in a church don't need signs. Okay. We don't need a sign. So it, it's not applicable as a sign within the church. It was a sign for a specific purpose. So um, and, and it's not a guarantee that people will listen to God. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to speak in tongues and, um, you know, hopefully that'll convict someone and they'll listen to God. No, uh, that that's not the case. So Isaiah 28 verse 11 through 12 is another, the, the, this passage says for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So people who do not, um, you know, do not believe God and are not listening to God, it's not necessary that, necessary that um, just speaking in tongues is going to be what pushes them towards God. The Apostle Paul makes the case that's actually prophecy will do a better job at that. So, okay, number 29. Uh, if the sign was a specific prophetic warning of a coming judgment, that does not mean it was its only purpose. So some also that don't believe in the continuation of this gift would say, yes, it was for a sign, it's not for today. It, it was used as a sign by God, but the gift of tongues was not exclusively a sign gift. That's number 29. It wasn't exclusively a sign gift. Paul just taught about this. We just, we've been reading this in 1 Corinthians 14, how it has a purpose within the church, in the church of edifying individuals when accompanied by interpretation, but it also has the benefit to the individual on their own, um, as even Paul, when Paul makes that statement, I speak in tongues more than you all, but in the church. So he's actually telling us something privately when I'm not in the community, 
I'm actually using this gift. But when I'm with you, uh, if there's no interpretation, I'd rather speak five words in something that could be understood. And that's also the case for me. I, um, you know, spending, we spent years, several years in some Pentecostal circles. And there were times when, you know, you would see a lot of just people speaking in tongues in public. And if, you know, it doesn't necessarily didn't bother me, but it made me not want to bring guests to church, <laughs> you know? And so, um, but at the same time, as frustrating as that was to me, I, I believed that I could probably sincerely say to some of those people, look, I speak in tongues more than you all, because I, I don't know about people's private lives, but it seemed like some people just use it as a show in public. Whereas for me, it's been something I've used in private devotional prayer for 30 years, nearly daily, you know, and I believe it's had a beneficial effect. That's why I am a proponent. That's why I would encourage everybody to at least seek and ask God, whether you, God says, or the spirit says, I'm going to give you that gift or not. I believe you should ask for it. And, I'll, and, the, and the reason why, once again, is based on experience and based on, on the example that we have the apostle Paul. Paul obviously used the gift. Um, he believed more than the cumulative use of the tongues within a church service in Corinth. And so uh, even personally for 30 years, uh, being able to use that gift in private prayer, it has uh, built my faith. It has strengthened my spiritual walk. And so it's, it would be no different for me to be enthusiastic about that shouldn't make anybody nervous because it's not to uh, emphasize one gift or the other. It's, it's no different than when I uh, talk to people about the benefits of water kefir or you know, if it was kombucha, you know, we don't make kombucha in this household. We've not been very successful at it, but, um, but I do water kefir and it's a probiotic and I've been doing it for years and it has had tremendous health benefits in my life since beginning to use water kefir, you know, more than a decade ago. And so, so yeah, if you, if, if you were talking to me about your health, uh, I'll likely tell you about the benefits of water kefir. And it's not only from, you know, the other people's anecdotal stories, it's, it's like from my own experience, it has benefited my well-being, my physical well-being. And that's why I continue to do it. Same thing spiritually. So if I become an advocate to say, I think you should at least ask and pray and seek the Lord, um, there, there are not so many people you know, there's a lot of Christians that aren't asking for it. So, you know, however the Holy Spirit distributes, I, it's not like he's got an allotment, you know, but it wouldn't hurt you to ask. And, um, and once again, it's not a better than Christianity. It's not a have and have not. The most important thing is that you are seeking the Lord and saying, Jesus, you distribute gifts to your people. I want to be used by you uh, in those gifts. You say you distribute them according to your will. So may your will be done in my life. So you should be open to anything, whether it's prophecy or God using you for gifts of healing or discerning of spirits or, you know, so the whole um, topic of just spiritual gifts in general. But nevertheless, the, the gift of tongues was normative, not necessary, but normative in the book of Acts. It has also been through uh, experience, praying for people and talking to people about when they, what they experienced when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's normative to hear people talk about their experience of speaking in tongues. So, I, yes. Uh, I apologize. Could you say 29? Okay, yes. 29 is sign gift. If you're just, if you're filling in the blanks, it's not, was not exclusively a sign gift. Okay, so I've already said this before, but... Um, Number 30, just so we have the blanks filled in, Peter also declared that the gift of tongues in Acts chapter 2 was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel, where God promised to pour out his spirit upon all flesh in, these, in the last days. So Peter said, what, what, you're, what you're witnessing is the fulfillment of this promise in Joel, that God said he was going to pour out his spirit. And as I've said before, uh, what's important is we see 
how God poured out his spirit on the Jews in Jerusalem, and then on the Samaritans, and then upon the Gentiles. So that would be Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 8, and then Acts chapter 10 are your from Jews to Samaritans to Gentiles, the spread of the gospel. But in every one of those cases, there was a pouring out of the Holy Spirit and, and speaking in tongues. And God was not a, you know, he's not a respecter of persons. So he demonstrated to the Gentiles, I'm giving you the same thing I gave my people or the, or the Israelites in the, the believing Jews in Acts chapter two, you're not a less than. And that is why I believe that God still does that today, so that we know that God's not a respecter of centuries, that he doesn't say, oh, well, you in the 21st century, you get something different, you know, I'll give the, I'll give, I'll distribute, this as a normative experience in the first century, but you, you guys don't get what I did there, you know, you get something else. So, I, so that's my argument for why I believe it still is a normative experience to, to God's show it. God's showing us that he is still fulfilling that promise in Joel. It's still the last days. He's still pouring out his spirit. And that's exciting. So number 31, the sign was a warning to unbelievers, not believers. If you remember in Joel and, and Peter quotes it, he doesn't just quote the good part about the spirit being poured out and the sons and daughters prophesying and the old men dreaming dreams and the young men seeing visions. What else does he prophesy about? And, and Peter includes it, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. And then he be, goes into judgment. There's a judgment coming. And not only was there a judgment coming in uh, 70 AD, but there was, there's also a judgment coming that we're anticipating, a judgment coming upon the earth. So however way you see that, we see that the Holy Spirit is poured out and will continue to be poured out leading up to uh, judgment, you know, and so we are, so it's still, that was in Acts chapter two, assigned to unbelievers. It wasn't to the believers. It was to the unbelievers that look, this is the time. This is, the, this is when you talk about a sign, it's almost like a, a road sign. <laughs> you know, you could say, this is giving you some helping you understand what, what track you're on and uh, how many miles to the next destination. We're, we're now seeing the fulfillment of significant prophecies. So the church was not facing judgment because of unbelief. So they don't need that as a sign. By the way, what this, this argument by the Apostle Paul really is the one, what I would call seeker-sensitive argument that we do find uh, as instruction for the church. He anticipates, even though, as I said on Sunday, I don't believe the church should cater to the lost. The church gatherings, especially on Sunday, are meant to build up disciples and to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, and I believe that that was the case in the first century church and should still be the case today, but nevertheless, it is anticipated that there is going to be times when unbelievers do come into your midst. And so the Apostle Paul mentions that. He says, look, we, we know this happens. People that are not believers will come and check it out. They're going to see what's going on. And when they come in, and if they come into an environment where you're all just speaking in tongues, and it's a bunch of gibberish, and, they have, and it's a bunch of confusion, they're just going to say you're mad. So, so the Apostle Paul is not in his, this one seeker-sensitive teaching is not saying to the church, you should water down the gospel. <laughs> He's not saying you should soft sell the gospel. He's not saying you need to, you know, in fact, make, make the, the path for the sinner in the church just as smooth as possible. And in fact, he says just the opposite. He's saying, look, you want an unbeliever to come in and not be distracted from the gospel by stuff that doesn't need to be there, you know? He says, rather it'd be better if you have prophecy, then they're convicted and they fall on their face and, and in repentance, you know, as the, the, the thoughts of their hearts are revealed. That's not very seeker sensitive, you know. So the idea is like, you don't want the seeker to feel comfortable uh, to remain in his sin if he comes to church. It should be, I, it, uh, if a seeker comes into the church, they should feel conviction over their sin 
in the presence of God and in the presence of God's people. And they should either say like, either I'm gnashing it, you know, gnashing of teeth at, against, you know, this idea of God and repentance. And I want to get out of this place because I don't want anybody and I don't want to be near a place where I'm being convicted or they say, no, I, I have this, I need to um, re repent and humble myself before God. Okay. So number 32, you know, didn't Paul just say though, that it was a sign to unbelievers. So doesn't this sound a little confusing? He says, you shouldn't be unbelievers coming to your midst. You shouldn't be speaking in tongues, but yet Paul said it was a sign to unbelievers. Is he contradicting himself? Uh, why wouldn't they speak in tongues as a sign then? Because the sign of tongues does not bring people to repentance. The sign of tongue does not bring people to repentance. The prophecy he quotes says, yet they would not hear. Just as in Acts chapter 2, the sign of tongues did not bring people to repentance. So, all right, verse 24. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall in his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So that's what we want to see. So 33, prophecy is ideal for visitors, because when the secrets of their hearts are disclosed, they will know that God is present and they will be convicted and repent. And that's much different than some of the modern loosey-goosey prophecy movement stuff that I've seen uh, at times that I, I don't um, think is always genuine. And that's, that's more of the prosperity gospel type of prophecy where, you know, the prophet stands up and, and one by one tells people their fortunes, you know, essentially, and says all the good things that are going to happen to them. And, and it's not that God won't tell you good things that are going to happen, but if we were to gauge, okay, what does prophecy look like in the church? Well, in this case, if there's unbelievers present, whatever it is, it brings them to repentance. It causes them, it says, to fall on their face and worship God. So if you have that, if, you, if I see that, I'm going to like, wow, that's the real deal. So that's what you want. I'm not, I'm not uh, I don't want to be the, just the judge and the critic of, of what, how people use gifts in the church necessarily, but it more comes from a heart that I really want to see genuine. You know, if it's, if it's the real deal, then amen, let's, let's see it manif that manifestation of the real deal. But how do we know if it's the real deal? Well, we, we get some clues here as to what will the fruit be from this. And we're not, you know, this isn't a teaching necessarily on prophecy, but, um, let's, but let's keep reading. So verse 26, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Let me just pause there for a moment. This, this passage has possibly been taken out of context. Um, because if you, if, as we read it in the context, many people have made this to be a prescription for the church. This is not a prescription. This is a description of the Corinthian church. So it is not given as a prescription. Paul is not saying, um, this is what I want you to do. I want you as a church, when you come together, to every one of you have a psalm or have a teaching or have a revelation or have a tongue or have an interpretation. He's describing what they are doing. And what has the whole three chapters been about at this point? Correction out of orderness things that he's saying you all come together and everybody comes with something and and there's and it just you're all stepping on one another things are out of order so notice what he says next he he doesn't say okay everybody line up one by one and everybody get their time and just be orderly one by one until you all get done even if it takes you to midnight what he says in verse 27, if anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or three at the most. <laughs> Notice he doesn't. So if you got, a, if you got, so if everybody's coming, we don't know how many people in the church, let's say there were a hundred and, uh, you know, 50 of them came with a tongue to give. Does he say you should all 50 line up and take turns one at a time? No, he doesn't. He says, no, I, 
I want you to just have two or three at the most. I want you to have some order here and, uh, and make sure that someone interprets. It says there should be two, two at the most three. So he caps it off at three, no more than three. Uh, and each in turn and one must interpret. But if there's no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So here we have it. So the, this also tells us number 34 here, the gift of tongues is controlled by the will of the person who has the gift. It is not out of their control. And that is why they can take turns in order and be silent if necessary. If you couldn't take turns and be silent if necessary, if it was somehow out of your control, then it could not be regulated. You can just say, well, Paul, you can't, I, we can't help it. You know, the spirit comes upon us and we just go off. Now that may be the case initially when the spirit comes upon someone unsuspecting, but, but that's not the case uh, thereafter. So a person can, can decide that they're going to speak in tongues or they can choose not to. And so the, the most important thing is that there is, there is order. And that's what he is really emphasizing for the Corinthian church. They were out of order. So verse 37 says, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. So Paul is, Paul is asserting something here. And what he's saying is somewhere, somehow you've gotten kind of the green light to do these things. And maybe it seems to be anticipated here that there was someone there saying that they were a prophet and were saying, hey, we should do these things. And this is the order of things. Um, so he's, he's, he's basically saying, look, if you got someone in your midst telling you otherwise, because they say they're a prophet or they're spiritual, let him recognize this. The things which I am writing to you here are the Lord's commandment. He was speaking with the authority of an apostle. And he says, but if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Meaning if he's going to contradict, if you've got someone that's contradicting this, do not recognize him. You need to, you need to understand the authority that God has established. So therefore, my brethren, and this kind of is, this is the wrap up here. This is how he brings three chapters to a closing. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. So number 35, these instructions about the gifts are not just Paul's opinions. They are commands from Christ. And that has a lot of weight. That's why uh, I don't like tiptoe around this. As uncomfortable it is, and I, I will... I will be honest with you because growing up Baptist and then uh, getting involved in some charismatic and Pentecostal circles and being really um, not always on board with some of the things going on and then um, becoming a part of a church, Living Water Fellowship, which I love, where I believe there's balance. We also know that in a mix, what I refer to as a mixed multitude, we're coming from different backgrounds. So you have people that have non-charismatic backgrounds or charismatic backgrounds and those who have experienced some of these things and those who have not. Uh, I don't have any desire to push any particular agenda except the Bible's agenda. And so when I see something clearly taught in scripture and Paul here making this strong emphasis, what I am speaking to you here, these aren't just my opinions. I'm speaking the commands of Christ. That is how, so all of these things we've talked about, these are the commands of Christ. And it and it's so it's important. And one of the, but one of those commands right at the end here is do not forbid to speak in tongues. So number 36, Paul closes this discussion of the gift of tongues and prophecy with a final exhortation not to go overboard and forbid people speaking in tongues during the church service. So that's the, that, you know, he doesn't want them to pen, pendulum swing, which does happen and has happened where you could get to the point where, you know, it's like, oh my goodness, someone just spoke in tongues and there was no interpreter. Well, we all agree there should be interpreter. 
but we also don't want to get to the point where you forbid someone from speaking in tongues and we just put the lid on it all together. So, um, and that's, you know, that that's just part of that balance. So Paul says, don't go overboard where you get to the point where you're not allowing, because that could happen. You know, the, the church could get this letter and they go like, oh my goodness, we've been listening to this prophet here. He's been telling us we need to be doing these things. We're kind of out of order. Paul wants us to be in order. Let's just make it simple and let's not have any tongues or any prophecy or let's just simplify it. And so that's, that's going overboard as well. And so there, is, there isn't a, a appropriate time uh, to, to have the gift of tongues. That's why places like, um, you know, Calvary Chapel in, in their history, they would have afterglow services. They would basically try to create an environment where there was a little bit more freedom for that. Certainly, we would have that in our prayer meetings. We've had that at other times of like all night prayer meetings or times when you're uh, in smaller groups or um, I, I think there are times that there are appropriate. So this is number 37. There must be appropriate occasions for people praying in tongues all at once because we have three occasion in Acts where that was the case. So there are, we, we have testimony of when the Holy Spirit falls upon people that all of a sudden you've got a bunch of people praying in tongues. So it must have an appropriate uh, place in certain circumstances, because I couldn't imagine in any of those, the apostle Peter telling everybody to shut up because there's no interpreter, you know, uh, think of that as Cornelius, Cornelius and his household, the Holy Spirit falls on, them. they begin prophesying and, and speaking in tongues. And we don't see Peter like, hey, be, oh, oh, we don't have an interpreter. You got to stop right now, you know? So, so there's a time of like, the, as the spirit is being poured out upon people. So for example, when we're, when we're praying, if it's, if it's just individuals or it's a small group of people and, and people are seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit and we're going to be praying for them, I guarantee you, you're going to hear some praying in tongues, you know? Um, and so that is, I don't think that that's the, the, the situation that Paul is addressing really is in this public gathering of the church for the purpose of edification for being built up and so but there must be there must be times just based upon once again the scripture so it's it's not proper to forbid tongues that would be breaking a command of christ okay so i mentioned groaning and uh romans 8 26 through 27 speaks about the spirit groaning it's not real clear in Romans 8 whether this is just the spirit groaning or if we're to understand this as the spirit in us producing a groan. So I will uh, will make that caveat, but at the same time, I'll just read it here. It says, in the same way, the spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So I've just included this in here. Number 38, praying in the spirit may be expressed as groans. Um, and that if we think that that is strange, then I'm going to, we'll have another verse we'll look at here in a moment of Jesus, a time that he groaned and may actually have been a prayer. They, uh, you know, one of the things I've heard over the years from people about their, and an apprehension to tongues that not believing that's genuine is because when they have heard it, they have, they have said, well, I heard someone speaking in tongues and it sounded just like a few indistinct syllables repeated over and over again. Um, I have heard that myself. I've also heard very elaborate you know, tongues uh, from other people. And uh, if you talk to Harry Padilla, so talk to Harry about this sometime. He's, he's great. He, he really believes he has multiple, you know, multiple tongues he can pray in. And, and it's, he can, he says he, if he faces one direction, it's one tongue. And if he faces another direction, it's another tongue. Uh, you could ask him about it. It's very interesting. But nevertheless, when I hear people try to discredit tongues because they say, well, it's just simple and it's just, it seems like just repetitive. 
um, let me just read Revelation 4, verse 8. It says, the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And they say it over and over, and God has created these creatures to basically repeat this over and over and over he it does not offend god it doesn't trouble him so and it doesn't trouble me if god was to give someone uh a tongue and all they're saying is hallelujah which is praise the lord you know you could say you know i don't care uh, god doesn't wouldn't mind if you said hallelujah 30 times to him if you meant it each time but if it was something that's coming from the spirit of god it's not for me to judge and i don't think it's for us to judge so it's not i don't believe that's a um I don't believe that that is necessarily a, a good argument against tongues. But as I mentioned that there may be uh, groanings too deep for words, I don't have the reference here. I'll just, uh, you'll know the story. Maybe I do have it later, but uh, um, Jesus, when Lazarus died, you know that he went to the tomb and he wept. But it also said that Jesus, when everybody was uh, upset, the, especially the women, that they were upset that he hadn't got there in time to, to heal Lazarus. And Jesus spoke to them, and they just still seemed to be in dismay. It, Jesus, it says that Jesus groaned in his spirit. Jesus groaned in his spirit. But then when he gets to the, when he's at the tomb, and after he groans in the spirit, and this isn't verbatim. I don't have it in front of me. I'm just giving you kind of the cliff notes here. He begins to pray and he says, God, I thank you that you've heard my prayer. <laughs> so he, he, well, what prayer, what prayer did he just pray? But, and so he, and then he prays out loudly so everybody could hear and understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. So John 11 and uh, here, I'll read this. Okay. So John 11, it says, um, Let's I want to see the part where he groans here. Okay, he was deeply moved in the spirit. Okay. So, and so Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. When did he when did he say something? But he publicly professes that God had heard him. So, and then he prays. So uh, I believe that that, that groaning you know, might have been what he's referring to, that that was spoke, spoke volumes to God. Uh, and it was just a groan. So to me, I, you know, if the spirit of God comes upon you, and out comes a groan, praise the Lord. Jesus did it too. And it was by the spirit. And you shouldn't think that that's strange or bizarre. Um, okay. Also, Jude 1, 17. And following it says, but you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So now there would, there might be some that will make, try to make the argument that praying in the spirit here is not synonymous with praying in tongues. Maybe it's not, but the only other reference that we have to praying in the spirit is from the apostle Paul in first Corinthians 14. He says, I will pray in the spirit. I'll pray with my mind or pray with my spirit. I'll pray with my mind. I'll sing with the spirit. I'll sing with my mind. So that's the, only, that's the closest reference we have. And it doesn't even say just, just praying like by the Holy Spirit or under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It says praying in, this, in the Holy Spirit. So maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a reference to speaking in tongues. But whatever it is, uh, I'd love to hear, you know, I'd love to know how it's distinct from other prayer, because it's listed as something distinct in prayer. But whatever it is, it says it builds up your faith. So I can testify that uh, praying 
in tongues, which I would also refer to personally as praying in the spirit, builds up my faith. And that's why I'm an advocate for it. Uh, not saying that there aren't other things that can build up your faith, but if there is, it, it's just like there are other probiotics than, than uh, kombucha or <laughs> water kefir, you know? So you can have yogurt, you know, you can, there's other things that can benefit you. So, but if, if you would like to access whatever can make you healthy and spiritually healthy, if there's something that you knew, whether it's reading your Bible, whether it's praying with others in a group, whether, you know, whatever other things, hearing testimony builds up your faith. It says faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So hearing testimony builds up your faith. I want all of that. I want my faith to be strong. So, so if I know that there's something known as praying in the spirit that builds up my faith, then I want to, I want to do that. So if, if there's something else that you understand as praying in the spirit, other than speaking in tongues, then you certainly do that. All right. Is that all of your, is that all the blanks or are there more? There's some more. Okay. Builds up your faith. Verse 30. Okay. Number 39 builds up your faith. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this. Just uh, James three, when it talks about the importance of the tongue, this is why to me, speaking in tongues is a very strange occurrence. Uh, you wonder why did God choose something like this to kind of manifest his spirit in Acts chapter two and then throughout church history. We're not told exactly, except that we do know in James that the tongue is the most unruly member of the body. And it says, who can tame the tongue? So allowing God to have access to our tongue, have his spirit, I think is um, possibly one of the things that God is, is really wanting to do. And, uh, but that, once again, that's not the context of James chapter three. There's, you know, there are people who, you know, will, that pray in tongues and they don't live holy lives, you know, so praying in tongues does not equal a holy life because that's praying in tongues may build up on your, build up your faith, but it's not the only instructions that we have. Uh, you know, about the Christian life. It's just one of many things. So I've encountered people in, in charismatic or Pentecostal circles that, that they will pray in tongues, but they're not really living a godly, holy life. So it's not an indicator. It goes back to the early illustration that I gave you of the tree. You know, if you found a tree with a bunch of watches or and jewelry on it, you wouldn't think that that was a watch or jewelry tree. You would say someone's placed that upon you judge a tree by its fruit. So if you see an apple tree, so a Christian needs to have the fruit of the spirit. That is more important. The gifts of the spirit are not an indicator. Um, and we've, this is old Testament, even through the new, because Balaam prophesied God allowed Balaam to prophesy even about the Christ, but Balaam didn't have, had no fruit of righteousness. He was a bad character. He's mentioned three times in the New Testament, and all three references are bad references. Nothing good to say about Balaam. And yet he prophesied. Same thing with Saul. Saul prophesied when he was uh, disobedient to God, and he was chasing David around. He came into a group of prophets, and he began to prophesy. Didn't make uh, Saul a good person or a holy person. So the gifts are not the indicator of whether you're truly walking with the Lord. The fruit of the spirit is the indicator. And that's why the inward work of the spirit takes priority. And that's lands us in, you know, first Corinthians 13, when the apostle Paul says, I'll show you still a better way. If you, if you have all these gifts, but you have not love, it profits you nothing. So love and the fruit of the spirit takes priority over the gifts. And that's why I have no problem. If someone is, has the fruit of love in their life, but they don't speak in tongues or they don't prophesy. It's like, well, praise God. Cause I've known people who can speak in tongues and they don't have the fruit of love in their life. And if you had to have one over the other, it's better to have love and not to have, you know, so there's no reason to get hung up 
it's it's not an it's not an either or but it is a priority of, of love first the fruit of the spirit takes priority over the gifts and so um and yet i believe as i've said the gift of tongues as well as prophecy and the others can be beneficial both to the body of christ and to you as an individual so the the question we're gonna i'm gonna open it up for questions but let me tackle a couple of the um of the ones i hear a lot one of them is you know do i have you know do i have to speak in tongues and no, the Bible doesn't say you have to speak in tongues. It doesn't say that everybody does speak in tongues. My question I ask to people is, you know, can you get to a place in your life where you could honestly say, why wouldn't I want to if it's available to me? You know, so what, don't let there be a hang up over it. Don't be apprehensive to it. It would be better to not be apprehensive because then it just shows God that you are pliable and you're you're willing to humble yourself and say god whatever you want is what i want and so so i i really encourage i encourage people just to be open to it but at the same time it's not you know did did billy graham ever speak in tongues probably not i don't know but did god use him in a powerful way certainly and other evangelists uh, dl moody speaks about uh, being empowered by the spirit of god I don't know if he ever spoke in tongues, but he certainly knew what it was like to have the spirit of God come upon him and empower him. And that's really what's most important is that you're a person who's, when, when God is calling you to minister, to be empowered by the spirit, it's just, sometimes it's helpful to, to know, wow, what is that? What is that like? What does that mean? You know, have I ever been filled with the Holy spirit? Well, I believe you can be filled with the Holy spirit and not necessarily speak in tongues. That is, that is different than some churches teach, you know, I know the Assemblies of God, which we are a part of, um, they taught that you, that speaking in tongues is what they would call the initial evidence doctrine, that if you, if you don't speak in tongues, then you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't, I don't, couldn't, I didn't uh, adhere to it then, I don't adhere to it now. I still stand by scripturally that I believe it's normative, but not necessary. Uh, but I do believe it's necessary to love, and I believe that we should just follow the instructions of Paul that says, pursue love, but desire earnestly the gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So if you really had to, like, like really press in on one, he actually emphasizes prophecy. Okay, so um, if, if Jesus baptizes you or someone else in the Holy Spirit without the gift of tongues... You also have to know that's up to that's up to Jesus, but it is normative for him to do so with the gift of tongues for many other people, you know, so it's not it's not a comparison, but you do have to just be willing to be biblically think biblically about it have a biblical worldview about tongues, that it was normative continues to be normative, so we shouldn't be so skittish about it doesn't mean that you must or will speak in tongues, but be um, considerate of those who that's what God has done in their life and just be thankful, like praise God. Now that's great. And uh, so we've, we've seen that. And so I do, you know, if, if you came to me and you said, hey, Pastor Philip, I don't know if I've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Could you, you know, you and the pastors lay hands and pray? Oh, certainly we will. Then the question will be in your own mind, well, how do I know? <laughs> You know, when do I, what, what's the, what, there was always some way, I believe that the Holy Spirit will manifest himself in some way that you know, because people always knew when they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So once again, maybe it's manifested all of a sudden in, in a supernatural boldness, but it's often manifested in, in prophecy or speaking in tongues. So that's why, so I encourage it. I'm like, well, that would definitely be helpful if you all of a sudden began praying in tongues, you'd be like, oh, that's it, you know, and then it's, so um, another question that is common is why do, why do some people focus on the gift of tongues? You know, we've played, look, I've even placed a focus on it these last two classes. And once again, um, 
that sometimes it's just due to the enthusiasm, due to the personal impact in their own lives. But uh, other times it's just, for me, it really is just from a biblical standpoint, we, we see this, the, the gift of tongues as being one of the common evidences that people were filled with the Holy Spirit initially. Um, okay, let's see here. Are there counterfeit tongues? Okay, that's another question. Yes, I believe there are. I think people can make things up. Uh, don't I don't recommend that. Um, can can Satan mimic a tongue? I don't know. I've heard that, you know, Satanists or what I don't hang out with Satanists. So I don't know, you know, I wouldn't recommend you hang out with Satanists. Do they do they speak in tongues in their service? Does can Satan do that? I don't know. I don't care to know. I don't I don't I don't care to know. Um, but we know that Jesus said specifically, if you being fathers know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give good gifts, give the Holy Spirit to you who ask? So if you're asking God for something good, you don't have to be worried. When people ask, are there counterfeit tongues? They're worried that if I ask God for this, what if I, you know, what if Satan somehow like does a, does a, you know, plays the linebacker, you know, and, and, uh, you know, messes up the play and, and the ball gets fumbled and all of a sudden I'm, Satan gives me a, a different tongue. That's ridiculous. You know, if you're seeking Jesus, or you're a believer and you're asking him for a good gift, you don't have to worry about getting something from Satan. Now, if you are uh, rebelling against God and you've disavowed your faith in Christ and you're hanging out with uh, Satanists and, you know, well, then I would be worried about getting something counterfeit. Uh, but then at that point, there's a bigger problem. It has nothing to do with the language you're speaking has to do with your heart. Um, how do I know that I'll receive something that is genuinely from God? Well, go, going right back to that. Well, you, if, you, if you ask for bread, he's not going to give you a stone. And then what if I'm open to the gift, but I don't receive it? Well, that's, uh, that's fine. He says, desire earnestly the gifts. It, and there's nothing to keep you from keep seeking and keep knocking. I'll give you an example that's not based on tongues. And it's been, and I even shared this recently on a Sunday. Uh, I have been in groups where we have prayed for people for healing and, uh, and I've seen people healed, but me personally, I've not encountered that I know of a, you know, and a, a miraculous healing based upon, you know, laying hands on someone and really sensing God do a miraculous healing. Nevertheless, there's commands to, to pray in faith and to, to do that. So just because I haven't seen it in my life manifested in 30 years, do you think I just give up? And when you're in the hospital and you see your brother, you know, at almost at death's door, do you just say, well, you know, I prayed to ask for that gift 30 years ago. God never gave it. Or, or you could even say, well, I've prayed for that number numerous times and, and I've not seen God use me in that. No way. I'm, I'm desperately asking God when I'm in that hospital room to say, God, right now, if you've never used me in this before, would you please use me in this now? You know, and if you choose not to, I can't, I can't do anything about that, but I'm going to pray in faith and I'm going to ask you and I'm going to lay hands and I'm going to pray. So I think we should be like that with all the gifts that you should just be pressing in and never give up asking. I, I, I sincerely believe we would all be better off if we spent the rest of our lives asking and seeking and knocking, even if we never, saw the manifestations that we might have hoped to see, you will not have lost out by spending that, that spiritual zeal to ask and seek and knock. I believe you will be a better Christian for it. I be, believe you will be a stronger Christian for it. So I'm just an advocate for continuing to ask and seek and knock on all the gifts. It doesn't mean that God will do it, um, but nevertheless, never stop asking. So, but, but don't also get get discouraged. You know, I, I shared the story of my father, who you know, was the first one to tell me back in the days when he was a Baptist, that, that, that the gift of speaking in tongues was no longer, you know, available in the church, that it was, it was in the past. But then, I, as I shared with you, he started going to church where they taught otherwise, and now he believed it. And he's, and I know that he has asked the Lord, and he has not received. He does not 
speak in tongues, but he has asked God. And, and I've seen him at his own church service when they have altar calls go forward and to be prayed for. So he still seeks and he still asks. And I think that's the right attitude that we, we have, we should have. And um, okay, um, let me see. I'm just looking at a bunch of different questions here. Uh, here's another one. Has I've already kind of addressed this one, but this is a question I've received. Uh, haven't there been great men and women of God throughout history that impacted the world for Christ without speaking in tongues? And the answer is absolutely yes. That's a, not even a question. So no, you don't don't these you don't have to speak in tongues to have an impact on the world. And so, um, but there's also been many stories about great men of God who impacted the world and neglected their families. But you wouldn't go and say that therefore you should neglect your family because they did. So that doesn't, that's not an argument for not seeking the Lord. And you don't look at a great man of God and say, well, Moody, you know, never prayed in tongues and look what God did. So I can just kind of dismiss it or, you know, A.W. Tozer, I believe probably did speak in tongues. I think he was in a denomination that believed that he definitely believed in the power of the Holy spirit and the filling of the Holy spirit. Uh, but A.W. Tozer is known for having neglected his family quite a bit. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not a good mark in his history. And even though I'm a big fan of A.W. Tozer, so, so I don't look at to his life and say, well, I'm going to dismiss all the good, but I, you know, Hey, he was able to do that without, you know, he was able to do great things for God and, and get away with neglecting his family. No, that's not how we do things. We just stay biblical. Just say, great. Praise God for the godly men and women who've done great things. doesn't matter whether they prayed in tongues or not, but we as individuals should just say, hey, this is what, if, if the Lord has called us to, if he's given us instruction on these, let's be biblical about those things. So, um, all right, so let's open it to questions here. We can do uh, Zoom and um, in-house questions if there are any, because we kind of bring this class to a close. Uh, you know, once again, the class so we don't forget, just because we're ending on the subject of tongues, the class is not really just about tongues. The class has been about the normative work of the Holy Spirit to, to be in the world, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment, to, to come and reside in us as believers, to, to bear fruit of the Holy Spirit, and then the Spirit can come upon us to empower us. And uh, so we looked at those examples in Acts. So any, any questions... Okay, so can you read that for me, Hannah? You referred to speaking in tongues being related to the type of worship that we see in the Psalms. We do have instances of prophecy in the Psalms as well as exhortations in, of God addressing his people, for example, Psalm 37 and 50. It is also possible through tongues and interpretation, even though it may be more rare. Okay, so yeah, so I made, a, I made a comment, and this is conjecture. So when I say I believe that tongues is, is probably much like what we read in the Psalms, I I'm cannot say that that's, you know, I can't quote chapter and verse that says that it's based upon the very few things that we learn from first Corinthians 14 in particular, when you're, when you're a person praying in tongues is giving thanks in Acts chapter two, it says they were speaking of the mighty works of God. Those that reminds me, I'm just saying that it reminds me those type of things, Thanksgiving, speaking about God, and the fact that Paul says he does not, when a person prays in tongues, he speaks to God, not to men. So it's, there's just, a, we don't have a lot there to be able to really, and that's why I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be dogmatic to say that speaking in tongues is not going to have some May, may or you know have some prophetic element where it's speaking to other people it's just i don't have any we don't have any examples of it but we don't have a lot of examples to go from you know it's it's kind of an argument from silence and but the the reason i had brought that up is um is more for the fact that in practice in charismatic circles it is not, it is common that people will speak in tongues and then someone will give kind of a thus saith the Lord interpretation. And I'm just a bit skeptical about that because that 
maybe it is the Lord, but a lot of times it seems a little, it seemed a little forced because it was seemed to be more of a, of a speaking to others. And may, but maybe that is okay. Maybe it, we just, we're not told. So I, I really can't say I'm just, so my comment about the Psalms is not really, uh, I can't say that authoritative. It's just conjecture that it, that it, uh, it seems to me that tongues is more prayer oriented. It's more towards God. But if, if the spirit is working and there's genuine interpretation, then we would know, <laughs> you know, then if you could discern that it was a correct interpretation and it was directed to, um, to the congregation, then certainly that falls, I believe tongue still does fall into that general category. It must of, of prophetic gifts in some sense, because Joel doesn't mention in his prophecy tongues at all. He just says, uh, I'll pour out my spirit and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see the visions. He doesn't mention tongues at all, but those were all ways that God spoke to us. So yes, Laura. When you mentioned about the passage in Acts 2 where they were speaking of the mighty works of God, um, the interpreters in that case were people from at least 15 regions that were saying, we hear them speaking in our own tongue. And so it wasn't so much that one of the 120 like stopped and said, let me give the interpretation. Yeah, that was translation. Was just... That was not interpretation. That was actually translation. They could, they, they understood what was being said and we get, and it was neat because we get some insight, but certainly if God is, is um, speaking, whether it's prophecy or tongues or a word of wisdom or word of knowledge. These are all the speaking, the miraculous speaking gifts or the supernatural speaking gifts. Uh, certainly those are gonna be directed, a, a lot of those are directed to um, one another from God. So, so yeah, I, I didn't mean to get us off course by, by having, having some bit of skepticism about things that I've seen in churches, which don't seem to, haven't seemed to line up, but, but that may be also, even without tongues there, I've seen uh, prof, prophetic utterances where I just thought were a little bit hokey, um, according to my limited discernment. Uh, so, and, and prophecy is to be judged. So things are to be critiqued and assessed. And, and I'll give you an example. This, maybe I gave this example already. I always forget if I did, probably did, but you get to hear it twice. So one of the rare occasions uh, it was in our church in Chicago and someone spoke in tongues and then someone gave an interpretation and the pastor just called it out and said, I do not believe that is the interpretation. Let us wait upon the Lord and ask for, for the correct interpretation. I've never seen that before, but I was like, oh, wow, that'll put the fear of God in you not to like goof around with this, you know? So, um, but, but that did, you know, cause, you know, a sobering of the service and then someone else did give a, an interpretation and and it seemed to all of us to be the correct interpretation so someone was out of line but that was it's rare that that the judgment is used appropriately of course that's on the subject of prophecy and but this was a tongue and interpretation and but the i think the pastor made the right call and did what what the, provided the oversight that god called him in that it was a smaller group setting but Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's uh yeah, let's do the ones on Zoom. Ephesians six eighteen speaks of praying in the spirit and seems to be linked to intercession. You mentioned joy, giving thanks, worship. And I don't recall you mentioning it in relation to intercession. I may have dismissed it. That has been my experience and I was wondering about it, so I was praying and I read that in Ephesians six eighteen and thought that it was an answer the answer was yes. It could be an intercession. What okay. do you think of yeah, an intercession. So can praying in tongues be an intercession? I believe let's look at the reference. That's Ephesians chapter six in the um, armor of God. So if uh, Josiah, if you want to read that or somebody, if you get it, whoever wants to get to there first, it says, and take up the, the um, six, what? 18. 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Yep. So that is another example, praying always in the spirit. 
Uh, that is intercession there. And once again, I'm, I will concede the point that that may not be speaking about praying in tongues, just, just as I concede the point in Jude. It's, those are, these are, these are um, common verses used to, to say, hey, this is another example of praying in uh, tongues. But once again, it's that there's not enough to, to truly clarify that. But at the same time, we have something about praying in the spirit, you know. So, so certainly I do believe that uh, the spirit is interceding. We read that and we already saw that in Romans chapter 8. When we don't know how to pray, the spirit intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So certainly that's deep intercession that... Um, it comes out even, as it seems it, what's why I tend to believe that that groaning is groaning coming from us, from the Spirit's interpretation. You would wonder, well, why would the Spirit have to groan? He knows what he's saying. He knows what he means. He knows how to express it. Um, but I don't know. You know, once again, I, I don't mind saying there are some verses that just don't seem to have enough clarity. We have a sense, and I could see it both ways. But if we look at it, that that groaning is ourself in, since we don't know how to pray as we ought to, we're leaning upon the Holy Spirit. And in that prayer, we, we only can groan because it's just too deep for us to be able to express what the Holy Spirit is interceding. Certainly, I would th relate that also to praying in tongues. And I'll, I'll share another, um, here's another example this is anecdotal, okay? This is just an anecdotal story. You can take it or leave it, but it's a personal one um, that I've shared before. So some of you have heard it. We were, we were praying for, um, it was just the pastors in a private meeting, praying for a man to be delivered from demonic oppression. Um, and uh, at the time, I was not sure how to pray. Uh, Pastor Little Bear and Pastor Al seemed to be a little bit more confident in knowing how to pray in that situation. So I let them take the lead. And because we were in a private setting, therefore, I just prayed in the spirit or I prayed in tongues. But I will say that that night praying in tongues, even though I don't know what I was saying, whatever I was saying was distinctly different than I've ever heard before. So it was a different tongue whatever it was, I could at least hear it. And I could hear that this is unlike anything I've ever prayed before in the spirit. At that time, a, this was at a retreat that we were having a men's retreat. And at that time, a, and not an unbeliever, but an ungifted man uh, entered into the room accidentally, not knowing that we were in there praying. And definitely uh, was a big shock for him to see a man who is being, you know, in a, in a situation where he's being delivered from demonic spirits and you got someone speaking in tongues and other people casting out devils. And, you know, so it's quite a, quite a thing to walk into. If you've never encountered that, he was like, Whoa, and quietly slipped back out. We had a conversation the next day, by the way, that man was delivered, uh, testified the next day to the work that God did in his life. But in speaking with the man who walked in, he came to me and to, to say, wow, Philip, when I came in, I knew exactly what was going on because of your prayer. And so I was assuming that, well, he must, and I says, well, you know, was, was it, I kind of wanted like more, some more information. And he, well, he had grown up Catholic, had gone to Catholic school and actually take, had taken enough Latin. He said, well, you were praying in Latin a prayer of deliverance. And, and he said, so, and he assumed, and I, so I thought, well, does he, does he know I was speaking in tongues? He was assuming I had gone to seminary and learned because the Catholics do have ex prayers for exorcism. So he was assuming that this was a, a Catholic Latin prayer of exorcism. <laughs> and that was his assumption. He had no, and no, I said, no, 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 I don't, I know no Latin. I've never prayed in Latin before, and I don't think I'll probably ever pray in Latin again. But um, I had no idea what I was praying. I was just praying in the spirit. And he says, what are you talking about? What in the world are you talking about? No, no, I was, I was praying in tongues. 
And this guy's like, what, what do you mean? No, no, no. You were, you were praying in Latin. And I'm like, well, I'm, I obviously, I guess I was because you understood it. And so, you know, so he understood enough to know that that, so that also is anecdotal, but it tells me that he, it was an intercession for that man by the spirit. And I feel and that helped me be a little bit more confident in those situations. That I like, you know, if all else fails, just pray in the spirit. You know, he knows what to pray. And then in this case, so uh, one of those, one of those interesting stories uh, that I, uh, I'm not uh, soon to forget, so. All right, okay, another question here. Scripture speaks of the fruit of the Spirit separately from the gifts of the Spirit. But I have known people who, after they were baptized in the Spirit, you could see a change. They're more Christ-like, gentle, humble, and loving. Is that sometimes a result of the baptism in the Spirit, or is it simply the result of walking in surrender to the Holy Spirit and a deeper relationship? Okay, so um, for those of you who are on Zoom, you can read it hopefully in your chat. For those of you here, did you all hear that enough? Close enough? Okay. I'll try to repeat it for the recording. The basic question is, um, when you know someone who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then shortly after you see a tremendous amount of growth in their life in both also the fruit of the Holy Spirit, are they, are they somehow related? I'm just kind of compressing this question down a little bit. And I believe, yes, I, I believe that can be the case when you get to a point of being in submission to the spirit of God and allowing him to, to work in your life in that way, certainly it's the same spirit. And, and by the way, so the spirit lives in you. And just as much as we may neglect asking the spirit to empower us for ministry, how often do you neglect the reality that the spirit is in you? I think we do that way too often. I believe that that's what quenches and grieves the Holy Spirit, that we walk through our lives uh, oftentimes very flippant about a rea reality that we are vessels that within us contain the very Spirit of God. And we don't always sense that. We don't always feel that, do we? You know, we, we believe that by faith. But part of the reason we don't always just feel that is because of uh, Galatians, what it talks about the, the flesh and the spirit are at war with one another. And so when, when the flesh is winning out, we really don't feel like the spirit of God is, is present in us. Uh, but, but there is a battle that goes on. So yeah, definitely coming to a place of surrender where you're allowing the spirit of God to fill you is, I believe, can be a, a very dynamic part of the Christian life that, that can uh, cultivate even those, that fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you are resistant, like I said, if you're a Christian that are going, that's like, I shared Joseph Graber's story with you, uh, back when he was being trained for pastoral ministry and professed that he believed that he needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but he refused. He says, I don't want to speak in tongues. And, and I believe that that was a problem. And I said, you know what? You can't say that. It's, it's the spirit that that's, uh, that's up to Jesus. It says Jesus is the one who baptizes in the spirit. And then he just, and the spirit distributes those gifts. That's up to him. That's not for you to. So if we're at any point in our life, posturing ourselves to dictate to Jesus or the Holy spirit, what he can or cannot do in our lives, that is going to be a hindrance. So if you can cross that threshold and get to a point where you're surrendered and you're saying, I'm all in. Whatever you want in my life, God, that's what I want. And I'm not going to dictate to you. So I do believe in that case that a person that really comes to that point of surrender and allowing God to use them are, are likely, at least possibly, more uh, easily cultivated in the, other, in the fruit of the Spirit as well. But nevertheless, I think you can cultivate the fruit of the Spirit. We're told to walk by the Spirit, not in the flesh. And if we walk by the spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that uh, we are expected to be cultivating in our life, uh, no matter what. So I don't believe there's any excuses, but certainly I have seen that also. Um, so I think that's a great question. All right, let's take one in-house here. Josiah had one. Uh, yes. So you covered in a previous class about the one speaking in tongues uh should also pray that he may interpret 
the only instance that I know of in scripture of someone knowing the language is in Acts chapter 2. Are there any other cases in the Bible, like examples, biblical examples of interpretation? And if not, why do you think that is? Do you think it's because the normative purpose of prayer in the spirit is for personal edification in prayer? So, yeah. So the question here for those online is um, the, the Apostle Paul instructs those who to speak in a tongue to pray that they also may interpret in the church service. But we don't have we don't have any examples of that. There's no there's no other, you know, Acts chapter two is the only but that wasn't the gift of interpretation that was translation, the people present, it was a sign, they were unbelievers at that point. So they're not they're not even believers, they haven't been bap. they didn't profess faith in. they hadn't even heard the gospel yet. So so they're hearing the other languages, but they understand them just like that man who came in and heard me praying in Latin. He didn't have the gift of interpretation. So what we have to what we have to look to in scripture and the closest thing we have is interpretation of dreams. And I know that may be a little bit of stretch for some, but at least it is it is about interpretation. So we know Joseph, you could study, you know, the story of Joseph and that that idea of having a dream, which is not clear, and then have, having to allowing the spirit of God to give him the meaning of it. So, so I don't believe that that gift of interpretation is necessarily the gift of translation. Because at that point, if it was, that would be very precarious. If the spirit of God is not on you at the moment and someone speaks in tongues, you'd have like, can you repeat that? Because I wasn't ready. You know, I wasn't ready. I missed that. But if you were, if you recall, there was a time when Nebuchadnezzar told Daniel, I'm not even going to tell you what the dream was and you have to give an interpretation. And so God revealed to Daniel, both the dream, which was not clear, which could not be understood by anybody. And yet he still got the dream. And then God gave him the interpretation of the dream, which is now can be understood. So it was interpretation. He was bringing, it's like bringing light to something that's dark. When God spoke, this, this is common, you know, God said this to Moses, actually he said it to Aaron, when Aaron and Miriam were giving Moses a hard time and God rebukes them, he, God speaks to Aaron. And this is once again, not verbatim. I'm just speaking off the cuff here. It's, but this is the general idea. He says, look, when I speak, I generally speak in dreams and visions and dark sayings, but not so with my servant Moses. With him, I speak face to face, which meant, meant I speak clearly to him. So, so God is not unaccustomed to speaking to, to us in prophetic ways that he refers to as dreams, visions, and dark sayings, meaning they're not clear. They're not clear. So it wouldn't surprise me that it's just not going to be necessarily clear when, if there's a tongue um, and, and that the interpretation is just going to bring light, it's going to bring it, bring clarity. It's going to bring light to something that's otherwise a dark saying. It's not something that can make a lot of sense in itself. But, but once again, that's where this, the church or the, the Bible is just silent on a lot of these things. I really wish we had deeper instruction on these. I, I wish we could have the apostle Paul here and drill him on, on some of this stuff because we, we can only glean a very few things from the passages. So we're, we're kind of stuck, you know, uh, I mean, so there's going to be some conjecture and, and yet we know that it's the spirit of God at work. Okay. Any, another question on zoom? The last question is what's the next school of oh, what, what's the next school of ministry? Class? I'm still praying about that. So there's a lot of different options, you know, so uh, if you have any suggestions, I'm open to suggestions, but um, I do have, I need to look through, uh, I've got a list of things that I wanted to cover in School of Ministry, but we've also gone enough years that there may be some things we, we've already now, this is the second class that has been repeated uh, in the last eight years. So, which is not too bad that the fact that in eight years, I've only repeated two classes but there may be other, other classes that we've done in the past that might be worth repeating again, or there may be some new classes. I was, I'm kind of 
would have loved to finish the, the class on Isaiah. We started that. Would love to uh, redo that maybe again and finish it. Um, that's, that's in the lineup as a possibility. I intended to continue on in our church history class. We, we covered like the first three centuries and, uh, but that was, in it, that was a very difficult class to prepare for. History is a challenging subject. So, so I don't, the, the answer is I don't know yet, but I am, we got a couple weeks at least, or maybe if we have to take a break, we take a break until I figure that out. But, um, but if you have, if you have some suggestions, I'd be glad to uh, hear those suggestions also. Any other questions as, before we close on this, the subject of the Holy Spirit or tongues or? Yeah, I have a question yes. As to like, uh, when you should ask God in your personal prayer time about being filled with the Holy Spirit, when you should ask somebody else to pray for you about it, should you do one before the other? And if so, okay. How much? So the question uh, from Stephen is when, when should you ask uh, privately to be filled with the Holy Spirit? When should you be? asking others to lay hands on you and pray for you or what's the, and I, I would say all the above, <laughs> you know, so I am constantly asking, but, but remember there's a purpose for being filled with the Holy spirit. It's not just so woohoo, I'm filled with the Holy spirit. No, no, no. You want to be filled with the Holy spirit to equip you to do ministry. So if you're not doing ministry, <laughs> then, you know, it's like, God, give me gas in my car, but I'm not going anywhere, you know? God, make sure there's fuel, you know, for my engine, but you have no plans to drive anywhere. It's like, well, you know, you, you need the fuel when you have a destination and when we are actively ministering, which we should be. So it should, it, so we should be asking God regularly to fill us with the Holy Spirit, but that also means that we should be actively ministering and once again, you could, I think, I think a stay at home mom should be asking God to fill her with the Holy Spirit, you know, in her, in her role of, of uh, shepherding the, the children at home. Uh, I think uh, a man needs to be praying for the Holy Spirit as he goes out into the workplace, because he's going out to be a light in the midst of darkness. I believe that as we come to church on Sunday, we ought to be praying before we get to church to be filled with this Holy Spirit because we have opportunities to minister to one another. So, and then uh, I think it is very appropriate. Certainly if you, if you are um, asking God specifically for either healing or um, you're asking for the gift of tongues or, you know, maybe a prophetic gift or whatever, certainly then there is uh, the, the example that we have of laying out of hands, the apostle Paul says to Peter, stir up the gift that it was in you. And he talks about, he actually attributes that to the laying on of hands that they laid hands on Timothy and they imparted a gift to him that now Timothy was to stir up. So there is the, the importance of laying on of hands. So I think we just avail ourselves of whatever you know we can, but it is with a purpose. And, and so I, I don't think that we should be uh, pleading with God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, just so that we can have the, the Holy Spirit feelies or whatever, you know, we're just, we, we want to, you know, we want to build our own, just build our own faith. It's like, well, it will build your faith, but ideally the spirit of God, according to Jesus was to come upon his church to enable them to be martyrs, you know, to enable them to be witnesses, uh, in the world. That's the, that was the main emphasis of the spirit coming upon them. All right. Well, it is past time. So if you, if we didn't answer your questions, that doesn't mean you can't at, ask them privately or at church on Sunday or whenever you see me or see one of the other pastors, um, feel free to do that. Let's close in a song and um, let's do uh, Jesus, I adore you. So it goes, or father, I adore you, then Jesus, then spirit, I like a nice, simple one. Okay. And if, uh, I guess if we want to do a round. <laughs> that's nice and around how about we do we could do uh we could do a round by um this table can start and then that room we got some singers in there over there and then the last and you get the kitchen can join them and then these guys i think could really belt it out you guys could be third all right
And I don't know how Zoom is going to do it. Okay, here we go. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Jesus, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Okay, it's not working, so we just have to do spirit all together. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> But uh, we're a little, little coordinated uh, challenge. Okay, we'll just all do it together now. Spirit, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Yeah, they missed the cue. Anyway, the Lord. It says, come before his presence with singing.